Uh, I think this is maybe the third or fourth time I've presented at this event or similar events. So if you recognize me from before, come say hello. I'll be around during the break later. It'd be nice to see some old faces. Uh, so I'm here to talk about Apache Kudu. Uh, Apache Kudu is one of the newest entrants to the Hadoop ecosystem. As Doug mentioned, we're always adding new things. Uh, this is less on the mature side, more on the, the new side. Uh, but it's something you should start looking at and hope to tell you a bit about it today. So first, where does Kudu fit in the stack, in case you haven't heard about it at all? Uh, actually, quick show of hands. How many of you have heard of Kudu? Oh, great. This is amazing. OK. Uh, it's about six months old. So the first couple of talks I gave, nobody had heard. Now it looks like a majority. So I'll try to move quickly through the introductory material and get to some of the more interesting pieces. So this is a stack diagram. I think Doug had the same diagram in a couple of his slides, uh, just showing the overall capability of the Cloudera platform and the Hadoop ecosystem in general. And the highlighted blob in the bottom middle is Kudu. So Kudu is on the storage layer. It's not a new processing framework. It's not a streaming engine. Uh, it's a storage engine. It doesn't do SQL on its own. It just stores bytes. Um, the difference from where it was before from other storage engines is what I'll talk about in this talk today. How does it compare versus the other components you see on this slide? Uh, namely, HDFS and HBase. Uh, but before I get into a lot of technical details and comparisons, uh, I wanted to kind of step back about three, three and a half years ago when we started this project. Um, sometimes our customers and users complain that the Hadoop ecosystem actually has too many components. You're always adding new ones. We can't keep track of which ones to use. So the decision to add a new one is something we don't take too lightly. So why did we decide to do this? So about three years ago, I was talking to our CTO. I had worked on storage, particularly HDFS and HBase, for a number of years. And we looked at what were the actual problems our customers had. And from working with a lot of customers and users, I found that there's basically two choices. And I made this graph. I joked that this is an MBA graph, not an engineering graph, because there's no numbers. It's just kind of like wildly throwing objects onto axes. Um, but the, the, the point comes through. That's why MBAs do it. Uh, so the two axes here may be too small to read, but the y-axis is the analytic performance. And by analytics, I mean fast scans of a lot of accumulated data. So maybe you're doing some kind of a batch process or an interactive query that really touches an entire day's data, maybe um, a day's worth of call data records for a telco use case, uh, or a day's worth of transactions for a more retail kind of use case. And for this workload, you really want to uh, batch ingest, probably. Uh, you probably want to read through that data as fast as possible for an interactive query. But the x-axis here is the fast random access. And for uh, HDFS, you actually don't have that capability hardly at all. There's no built-in indexing. There's no concept of row by row access. You can't update a record. Um, everything is kind of batch only. It's very good at the, the fast scans over your data. You can run Spark or Impala and accumulate a lot of data, run a job over a terabyte of data in a minute on a reasonable size cluster, uh, pretty easy. But you can't update. So on the bottom right, we had this other choice that started around 2008, 2009, uh, called HBase. And this gives you the opposite characteristics. We get fast random access. We can efficiently find and mutate a single row. Uh, we can have indexed reads. Um, and these are very fast, sub you know, millisecond kind of time, time scale, five to 10 milliseconds for an individual operation, tens of thousands per second per server. Uh, I think in this community, maybe Accumulo is also familiar, fits in pretty much the same bucket, where it's very good at random access. But if you try to run something like SQL or Spark over a system like HBase or Accumulo or Cassandra, you actually find that the scanning performance is pretty meager compared to what HDFS gives you. You're maybe only getting five or 10 megabytes per second per node. And if you look at, like, I just bought this massive new machine from Intel. It's got all these cores and all this RAM, and I'm getting 10 megabytes per second out of it. There's something wrong here. There's something missing. And we found a lot of customers had both of these types of use cases, and they were really having trouble because they could pick HDFS and they had to do a lot of workarounds to get random access, or they picked HBase, and they had pretty bad performance for the analytic scans. So 
So, uh, uh, of course, the big surprise, Kudu is trying to fit that red box in the middle here. But you'll notice one key thing. We're not higher up than HDFS. We're not farther right than HBase. We're not trying to be a better file system. Uh, we're not a file system. We're not trying to be a better NoSQL store that does random access great. Um, but you know, we're pretty good at both. So if you have any kind of workload that needs some characteristics of both of those systems, this will massively simplify your architecture because you can have one store that can do both things pretty well. So you might say we're bad at both, you know, HBase but uh, worse at random access, or HDFS but worse at scanning. Uh, I like to think of it we're a happy medium, kind of the Goldilocks choice, not too big, not too small, uh, in the storage systems for Hadoop. So the key points here that we've designed in are one, high throughput for scans. We want to be no worse than twice as slow as HDFS. Uh, low latency for random access. So if you use SSDs or other very fast storage, like persistent memory in the future, we want to have millisecond scale, random reads and writes. We want more database-like semantics, because that's familiar for people to code against. Uh, so that's the ability to update and insert and delete individual rows um, with some indexing. And a relational data model, for the same reason. We found over time, more and more users are not writing MapReduce, they're writing SQL queries, or they're writing Spark programs that have some knowledge of structure. I think some, someone asked earlier about um, you know, the tuples in Scala and how we have more information about types now. And this is sort of following that trend, saying, yeah, it's actually useful to have schema, because with schema, everything becomes easier to analyze and to use the data and to ensure data quality. So the other trend that we looked at uh, early on and why we decided to go for this project is the hardware landscape. So the first trend is spinning disks becoming less popular compared to solid state storage uh, for random access applications. So there's two kind of major technologies that are important right now. The first is NAND flash, which we've had for probably around 10 years, uh, but only in the last maybe three or four years has really become cost effective. And if you're not looking at price per gigabyte, but you're looking at price per I.O. performance, uh, per IOPS, NAND flash is way more cost effective than spinning disk. And you know, the sequential throughput's actually pretty good too. So one flash device, PCIe attached, uh, takes less space in your data center, less power, and can give you about twice as much sequential throughput as 10 or 12 disk drives. So if you're not capacity bound, flash is really starting to make a lot of sense. And the next trend, uh, which we were lucky enough to be working with Intel on for the last uh, year and a half, even before it was publicly announced, is 3D Crosspoint. So this is a new memory technology that's actually persistent memory. It's a thousand times faster than flash, and flash is already a thousand times faster than disk. So we're so many orders of magnitude away from where these systems uh, were originally designed. You know, Doug and Mike Caffarella back in 2006. Uh, this stuff was kind of not even a dream at that point. So it, it kind of makes sense that if we have entirely different hardware technology, maybe we can rethink some of the assumptions and choose different design points, designing a new system for, from scratch uh, for today's hardware. So the other trend that's a little bit less um, step function, but is continued to just aggressively push forward, is the price of RAM dropping. So when I started at Cloudera seven years ago, our customers usually had 16 gigs of RAM, maybe 24. Uh, now 256 is overwhelmingly becoming common. And people are saying, hey, I bought all this RAM. I need some software that can actually use it. I don't want to spend you know, um, a few thousand dollars on 256 gigs of RAM and then only be able to cache four gigs. Right? That's just not acceptable. And starting from scratch with the assumption that we have a lot of RAM means the same thing. We can choose different design points uh, to take advantage of this modern hardware. And the other big takeaway from both of these, these um, hardware changes is that CPU is the new bottleneck. Looking at our customers, a lot of them become CPU bound long before they're storage bound. Uh, and as the storage continues to get faster and faster, this is just getting more and more true. So we really need to design for storage, uh, sorry, for CPU efficiency first, storage efficiency less important. Um, 10 years ago, Storage was always the bottleneck because you could only do a couple hundred seeks per second on your rack full of disks. Now you can do a million per second or more on a stick of 3D crosspoint persistent memory. 
So we're going to redesign a lot of stuff based on that. So hopefully that gives you an idea of why we decided to move forward with a new project and some of the kind of overall design goals, um, why it was actually worth starting from scratch rather than just say, well, we can make some incremental optimizations to HBase or Accumula or Cassandra. Um, there's entirely different design points, entirely different context for this system than the systems that came before. So in this next section, I'll try to explain a little bit more detail about what Kudu is. So the one sentence version, elevator pitch, is scalable and fast tabular storage. Scalability, right now we've tested to 275 nodes, so about three petabytes. Um, that doesn't mean that when we hit 276, the system crashed or something. We just had this test cluster, we ran things on it, and it worked pretty well. Uh, it's designed to scale to thousands of nodes. Our biggest kind of um, community user that's been using this regularly recently is running on 200 nodes, having no scalability issues whatsoever. Uh, Speed-wise, we're looking at millions of random accesses per second on a cluster. So maybe tens of thousands per node, maybe 100,000 per node if you have fast storage. And for sequential throughput, we're hoping for millions, uh, sorry, multiple gigabytes a second or millions of rows per second per node. Um, maybe 100 million plus rows per second scan rates. So this is so you can do very fast interactive SQL or Spark analysis. And tabular, uh, this is a schema store. It's not like HBase, Cassandra, Accumulo. We actually, when we create a table, have a SQL-like schema with a finite number of columns. So you can think of this like a relational storage engine. If you're a MySQL user, you're probably familiar with uh, InnoDB or MyISAM. Uh, this is sort of a similar level in the stack. Uh, we store the rows. We don't ourselves parse or run SQL. We just do the storage of these tables. Of course, big data is uh, frequently changing, so we have fast alter table. Alter table doesn't need to rewrite existing data. There's nothing that's linear time in the amount of data. It's a constant time operation, a couple seconds to add a new column. And we're also not ignoring the, the trend of NoSQL that we've seen over the last you know, five, six years. Uh, we still have you know, row-level operation APIs. You can use Java, C++, or Python if you prefer that kind of access. But if you also have some analysts in your organization that prefer SQL, uh, you can do that too. So this is very much uh, NO as in not only SQL, not no SQL. So I'll highlight a couple of use cases and architectures where our customers and the community have started to see Kudu make sense. So the kind of two main buckets from a very high level uh, that I want to highlight are time series and online reporting. So time series, for example, we might have a market data analysis app or a fraud detection app, maybe a network monitoring app. Uh, so taking one of these examples, let's say market data. We get a lot of trade data in. Uh, we get a lot of stock ticker information. Here's a timestamp, uh, an equity symbol, uh, and the you know, high and low bids, whatever the, the tick is. And that data is constantly streaming in. And a batch ingest system is not sufficient for the type of work you really want to do. You don't want to wait until a nightly data load to find out, like, oh, yesterday my portfolio lost half its value. You kind of want to see this trend happening as it's happening. And the idea here is you need to stream the inserts and you need those inserts to be reflected immediately in any analysis that you do, whether that's a SQL query, an individual scan through a Java application that's trying to look up a particular ticker or timestamp information. It needs to be a real-time storage system, not a batch ingest storage system. We also, somewhat surprisingly to me, I learned this is the case, have a lot of updates in this kind of workload where you're maybe getting data from a number of market providers and occasionally one will call you and say, hey, sorry, we, we kind of messed up and sent you Japanese yen yesterday and we meant to send you US dollars. So you've got to go divide everything by 80. And if you have a system that can't support updates, you're really in trouble. You have to reload entire partitions, probably spending engineering resources to do this. And this is surprisingly common in a lot of applications that you think of as insert only. Even in a network monitoring use case, the majority of the data coming in is just inserting some IP flows uh, or packet sniff, anything like that. Uh, but you probably have some entity information as well that you want to join against, um, like routing tables, BGP information. So having the ability to do updates 
and then joins against the real-time information in this updated table is incredibly valuable, and having that in one system makes everything easier. So I spent a bit of time on time series, online reporting a little bit more briefly. This is kind of your bread and butter data warehousing. I'd say kind of data warehousing light, where you're probably looking at smaller queries more frequently, where it's less important to get this da uh, monthly data load and run some huge monthly analysis, but maybe you're trying to look at the results of some advertising campaign, or you've made some sort of a change to your network and you want to understand uh, how customers are affected by that, latencies on accessing some information, anything like that. Where again, real-time data availability is important, and you may have updates and changing information about users and customers that should be reflected in that online report. So people actually have these architectures today. Uh, you know, a lot of our customers do network monitoring. We're not trying to say, hey, you can now do something that you could never do before, but we're gonna simplify things a lot. So a lot of people I've talked to have this architecture. Uh, people usually nod and say, yeah, this is awful when I talk about this. We have a, basically an online real-time analytics application. And on the top left, we have some incoming data that's arriving through something like a messaging system, maybe from um, Flume or Kafka, some kind of streaming ingest system, or a legacy system that's sending you UDP packets, syslog, anything like that. And because there's no way to really insert data row by row into HDFS, we end up staging this data in something like HBase or Cassandra or Cumulo, some kind of a key value store that supports row by row inserts, streaming inserts. But people find that the analytic performance isn't good enough on that. So pretty soon they get these cron jobs that take HBase or this other key value store and dump it onto a Parquet file on HDFS. Uh, if you're not familiar with Parquet, it's a very fast columnar storage format that you can use on HDFS for good analytic performance. So then we've got these Parquet files, but your job's not quite done yet because you actually have these new files and your existing data, so you've got to run some sort of a job which maybe adds these new files into an existing table as a new partition, uh, maybe updates the metadata in the Hive Metastore. Um, and now you've kind of got your data coming in maybe once every half hour when this dumping runs. So it's not super quick to see the new data when you run analysis. And then after a while, you've got all these half hour or 10 minute files and your performance starts to kind of go down and you look at it and realize it's because you've got millions of small files on your file system and that's not the most efficient way to run a query. So you get these other cron jobs which do compaction and take small files and reorganize into bigger files uh, and you hope nobody's running a job at the same time that you try to do this switcheroo with replacing three small files with one big file. Uh, and usually these things tend to go wrong. It takes a lot of engineers to build, a lot of ops to monitor. Eventually you can get it though if you spend a lot of time and have a large technical team. But there's one more issue in that when you get this, this guy who calls up and says, sorry, we sent you uh, Japanese yen instead of US dollars, you're really kind of screwed. You have to go find whichever partition has that data, export that partition, somehow rewrite it so that the rows reflect the updates, and then do a swap. And again, a lot of complexity around handling concurrent queries and analysis. So this whole thing can be built, it's just very complex. So the idea with Kudu is that we support both styles of workload. You can have streaming ingest from your system if you have an update or a delete, very easy to do, just run the update or delete command, just like a Postgres or MySQL. There's no cron jobs to worry about, no monitoring. Everything is sort of baked into Kudu, handling all of these updates and inserts coming in. And your reporting request that you want to run will have performance that's comparable to Parquet. So you're getting best of both worlds here and a much simpler system to operate and manage. So as a concrete use case, I want to share one of our early adopters, a company called Xiaomi, who's a cell phone company in China. Um, I visited them recently and they gave me this phone. This is what they make. Uh, it's sort of an iPhone knockoff. Don't tell them I said that. Uh, <laughs> oh, this is recorded. Hopefully they don't watch it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, they're a very, uh, very, very popular. It's a good product, actually. I've been using it for the last couple of weeks. It's a good product. Uh, fourth largest cell phone maker in the world, very popular in China, uh, getting into India and other parts of the world as well. And like any uh, product provider, they want to make sure that customers are having a good experience. 
So whenever you use an application on their phone that might interact with a backend service, like they have um, you know, file sharing and photo sharing, all those typical kind of things you might expect from a mobile provider. And those backend services are accessing different databases. Some of them are using different storage. It can be complex stuff on the back end. And they want to make sure that their back ends are performing well, uh, not seeing error stack traces, uh, not having high latency, not error rates, all this kind of stuff. And they want to use that for real-time monitoring and troubleshooting. So this is very, very high throughput. They have probably a billion customers at this point, uh, and they're all using their phones all day long. Um, so that I think this, this 5 billion number on the slide uh, is a couple months out of date now. They're up to 20 billion inserts per day, uh, growing incredibly fast. And they need to query the data reflecting the most recent information because they might roll out an update to one of their services, and if that causes the latencies to spike or people with a particular phone model to start seeing errors, they need to see that quickly and they need to troubleshoot it quickly. So their engineers want to be able to say, oh, I got this crash. Give me the log from that phone that we've captured. What did that phone do before the crash? What software is installed? They want interactive query on this data that makes it much easier to resolve the issue, maybe halt the rollout of the new software, roll it back, uh, fix the bug, and roll out a fix within you know, half an hour, instead of waiting for the next day's bulk load, because if you've got a bad experience on your phone for an entire day, you may switch to Samsung or uh, Motorola, you know, a different phone. So they want to keep their customers happy and react quickly. Uh, this is pretty much, I mean, this is a particular mobile phone use case, but everybody has these kind of concerns. They need to react quickly, uh, they need to make changes, they need to understand what's happening, and get very interactive analysis of what's going on with their data. So I won't go too much into the details of their architectures. Uh, these slides were actually provided by them. Uh, before Kudu, they had something similar to what I was describing before, where you have a data source, and they're kind of teeing it to two different systems, sequence files and HBase, periodically running cron jobs once an hour or so to export that into Parquet, and then running Impala and Parquet for the reporting use cases. But that took them at least an hour between new data being available uh, from the, the, the phones and actually being available for analysis. And sometimes when they had problems, some part of this pipeline, because it's complex, had issues, it could be up to a day. So they were reacting very slowly to new issues that their customers were seeing. And there's a lot of just pain involved in this data conversion and synchronization process. So with Kudu, uh, the system is actually simpler. They can directly ingest a lot of this data. The application is writing directly to Kudu. In some other cases, where they care a little bit more about full durability and um, you know, don't have to worry about back pressure if Kudu happens to be slow or down uh, for an update or something, they use Kafka as a sort of buffer. Uh, and then they run Storm on top of Kafka to do some real-time ETL and write to Kudu. So even if they're using Kafka and Storm, it's sub 10 seconds. Uh, when everything is running smoothly, it might be 100 milliseconds. And the direct data ingest path is you know, 0 to 10 milliseconds. And then they can directly query that data from Impala, see the up-to-date data, much simpler architecture. All right, so uh, in the remaining 10 minutes or so before we get to questions, I'm going to try to zip through some architectural information about how Kudu really works. And first, we'll talk about replication and fault tolerance. So Kudu has a couple concepts you need to be familiar with, uh, tables, tablets, and tablet servers. If anybody here is a Cumulo user, these are the same terms. If you're a HBase user, uh, it's regions and region servers instead of tablets and tablet servers, same thing. Uh, so we take each table and split it up into little chunks we call tablets. This is horizontal partitioning, meaning that any given row, you can figure out which tablet it goes to. One difference from those other systems is that we support different ways of partitioning. We call it flexible partitioning. Uh, so, for example, you may want to partition by a hash on the timestamp. And you can do this in other systems by prepending that hash into your primary key, doing a lot of Java coding and byte array manipulation. Uh, we call it salting. Um, so this is kind of a more advanced H-based thing. Kudu does this for you for free. You can just specify when you create the table, uh, distribute by a hash of timestamp 100 ways, and then it does it for you. You don't have to worry about anything. It'll optimize queries based on this. Uh, basically simplifies your life. 
Every table also has a primary key. Again, familiar for a other key value store, uh, except that because we have schema, our primary keys actually encode the types and the idea of composite keys. So maybe for a metrics database, you might have host, metric, and timestamp. Or uh, for a network monitoring, you might have source IP, destination IP, timestamp, something like that. Uh, so we're very flexible. You can range partition, you can hash partition, you can uh, combine the two in different ways. It can get complicated, but the simplest thing is probably just hash partition by timestamp, you're good to go. So each tablet, each chunk of the table, also has to be replicated. And uh, Kudu does its own storage. We don't use HDFS or anything else underneath. We handle replication at the database level. And so each tablet has three replicas or five replicas, and we use an algorithm called Raft Consensus, which is very similar to Paxos, if you've heard about that. It's also very similar to how Zookeeper is implemented. It's a general, general family of algorithms called consensus algorithms. And if one of these replicas crashes, the tablet server went down or starts flopping and is basically unavailable, uh, we'll re-elect what's called a raft leader within about five seconds. And there's no long mean time to recovery. There's no log splitting. Uh, everything just fails over, boom, good to go. Should be zero impact to clients, as long as the client timeout is longer than the five seconds for failover. We also have, like those other systems, a master process. Our master process, of course, is replicated as well. In the current beta, there's a couple known issues with this, but it's definitely, for 1.0, uh, part of our roadmap. And the master server mostly does simple operations, keeps track of which tablets exist, uh, which tables exist, what their schemas are. Uh, it also does a little bit of policy management for the cluster, so stuff like load balancing. If a server uh, is down and we need to create new replicas to replace the ones we lost, the master makes these policy decisions. But it's important to note, no data ever flows through the master. It's metadata only. And because of that, it's a very small amount of data. And because we have so much RAM today, we cache all of it in RAM. So the master keeps all of this metadata cached in RAM, persistent on disk, of course, for durability, but cached in RAM. And we see uh, 99th percentile requests to the master be under 100 microseconds. So it's very, very fast. It's just doing quick lookups, C++ implementation, reading some data from a map, spit it out on the wire, good to go. So quickly illustrate this point. Um, this is a diagram we have on the top left, a client. This is a client library in Java or Python, C++. And it wants to read or write a row whose primary key is tlipcon. It's maybe an employees table or something. So it goes to the master and says, hey, where's this row? The master responds saying it's part of tablet two, it's on these particular servers. It also piggybacks some other information about nearby other partitions, other tablets. The client can cache this information. It's okay if the client's cache becomes stale, it can automatically invalidate and refresh. And then the client will send these updates directly to the leader replica of that tablet. Again, the leader replica is elected on the fly. It's not a static property. Uh, they just, when the tablets come up, they talk to each other, vote, and ready to go. So when the client actually sends the update to the tablet leader, it'll send a write RPC. This is all the implementation of the client. If you're a user, you don't care about this at all. It's all under the hood. And the tablet leader will then write to its local write-ahead log for durability and also replicate the write to the two follower replicas. Those replicas write to their write-ahead logs, and as soon as they've done that, they respond and say success. And as soon as the leader has seen a majority of write-ahead log writes succeed, that's sort of the guarantee that this write will never be forgotten. Uh, there's no case in which it could be rolled back or forgotten or corrupted, uh, guaranteed, will always converge after this point. This is not eventual consistency. This is a strict consistency. Uh, the details might get into a lot of academic stuff, so I won't go into them now. Um, but basically, the key thing here, strict consistency, uh, serializability of operations. So when the leader has achieved this majority, it can respond to the client. So if the client gets a success, your right was acknowledged, that's a guarantee we will not lose that right. 
If we lose that write, I'll stay up all night worrying about it and treating it like a highest priority bug. This is our primary guarantee. So diving a little bit into the columnar storage, which is the actual on-disk storage of Kudu. Um, I don't know if people here are familiar with column storage or not. Uh, this is kind of a very quick primer. I'll try to go through it quickly to leave some time for questions. We have an example table here, which is the Twitter firehose. Uh, the firehose term, if you don't know it, basically a table of all the tweets that ever happen. So it's a streaming insert workload. Probably fairly wide. I just showed four columns here, uh, but likely it's you know, 30, 40, 50 columns. And uh, we have a couple example tweets. And in a traditional row store database, we actually would see this laid out on disk in essentially the same order you would read it, where first we have all of the data for the first row, then all the data for the second row, et cetera. That's kind of the natural way you might lay out data, like TSV file or CSV file, right? Um, columnar storage is different. So we actually have a separate file, um, not technically a file on disk, but you can think of it, separate file, separate block, for each column. So we have all the tweet IDs in one, all the usernames, all the creation timestamps, all the text. So this initially seems kind of crazy because when we read one row, we're gonna have to do all this work to look at you know, four different files, reconstruct them back together. Maybe we're doing four disk seeks. And you're right, random access on column stores has traditionally been considered crazy. But now we have all this RAM and all these really fast storage devices and this trade-off completely flipped because doing four random accesses on a um, persistent memory device is like basically sub-microsecond, right? This is not something you have to worry about. Four random accesses on a disk drive, we're talking 40, 50 milliseconds. So these order of magnitude hardware changes is why we can now promise random access with a column store. So why would we want to do this? We established it's fast enough we could do this. What's the point? So the first thing to consider is column sizes. Here we have uh, four different columns. Likely the text column, the actual text in the tweet, is probably 100 to 200 times bigger than these other data columns like timestamps or uh, tweet IDs, right? And imagine you're an analyst and you just want to say, how many tweets did this particular user do? You're gathering some statistics. You want a fast, interactive response. To execute this query, we're only really reading the username column. So we just read that one column, we read two gigabytes of data, we don't need to parse, we don't need to do any IO for the other columns. So we're avoiding reading 200 gigs of data to serve this query, we're reading 100 times less data, and consequently you can expect the query to run 100 times faster. Uh, so for analytic workloads, this is where we get really good performance. And this is a, also an area where vendors like to cheat and say, my database is 10 times faster, 100 times faster, 1,000 times faster. You can pick how many times faster you want a columnar database to be by just adding more columns, right? I could add 10,000 columns and just read one, and now it's 10,000 times faster. So always be skeptical when evaluating comparisons of columnar and row stores. Uh, it's really workload dependent. But many, many workloads have this pattern, where most analysis accesses a minority of columns. So the other big trick we can do when we store by columns is enhanced compression. So take the creation timestamp column. And if you look at these numbers, they all start with the same six digits, right? It's kind of a waste to continue to use all those bits every time. So instead, what we can do is store the difference between the two columns. This is called differential compression. And the differences tend to be a lot smaller numbers. They only need 17 bits each whereas the original ones were needing 64 bits each. And a lot of actual workloads, this can compress even down to one or two bits per entry. So you're getting many rows packed into a single byte, which is really much better than you can do in a row-based storage system. So we get a few bits per row instead of a few bytes per row. This works great for timestamps, other time series values that change infrequently but are measured frequently. Low cardinality strings, can also use a thing called dictionary compression. Uh, so people tend to store enumerations or other kind of like city name, something like that. Uh, state name, there's not that many states, you don't need 
uh, eight bytes per state, but there's some pretty long state names. Kudu will figure this out and code your states in you know, six bits, whatever the minimum number of bits are required. So this saves you a lot of space, which is good, because this fancy new hardware isn't that cheap. It's getting cheaper, but it's not free. It also improves your performance, because you don't need to read as much for the same query. Uh, I'm going to skip forward a little bit, just so we have time for questions. Um, that's not that interesting anyway. Uh, quickly covering integrations, we do integrate with Spark. Uh, it's a little bit work in progress, uh, but we're continually improving it. We also have Impala integration. You can run uh, create table, insert, update, delete. Impala now feels a lot more like a capable SQL database. And of course, the old MapReduce, as Doug mentioned, it's not dead yet. There's still people using it, and we still support it. We do a lot of our testing and integration work with MapReduce. Performance-wise, again, I'll move quickly so we have time for questions. We ran a TPCH analytics benchmark on a 75 server cluster and found that actually we outperformed Parquet for this benchmark. So we expected no worse than twice as slow. We ended up 30% faster. This isn't true in all use cases, uh, but you can expect Kudu performance to be similar to Parquet. Compared to Phoenix on HBase, which is a SQL engine on HBase, uh, this is a log scale graph. The slides will be online so you can look at them carefully. The summary is that we're between 10 and 100 times faster than Phoenix unless you're just doing single row um, reads and writes. For NoSQL random access using YCSB, uh, we're actually about twice as slow as HBase. Again, we figure if you're really going for a NoSQL style random access only workload, great, keep using HBase or Cumulo, whatever you use. If you want analytics too, you're probably worth giving a 2x penalty to random access if you get 100x faster analytic performance. So if you want to get started, uh, we're Apache open source project in the incubator. Uh, we're doing releases every couple of months. Uh, it's reasonably stable, though it is an immature product. We got a sort of beginning community, some early adopters, Xiaomi that I mentioned, contributions from Intel, et cetera. Uh, we'd be happy to have more people in the community. So check out our website. It's uh, getkudu.io, or you can join our mailing list, download our quick start VM if you want to just play around on one machine. Uh, if you use CM, you can get parcels and a CSD in order to run it on a cluster. We're also looking for developer help, so you can find us on the Apache Jira. You can find all of our code review traffic, et cetera. Uh, come talk to me if you're interested in contributing. So uh, we have about two and a half minutes for slides. Sorry, I didn't or for questions. Sorry, I didn't leave quite as much time as I'd hoped. Uh, any questions I can answer? So what's the primary uh, way that you use to load uh, data into Kudu? Do you use Flume, or is there? Yeah. You have um, to... So it sort of depends if you're looking for streaming load or bulk load. Currently, we don't have a bulk load feature, per se. But you could use Impala saying create table as select star from some other table. And that's a pretty easy way to do it. For streaming ingest, there's a um, very early stage Flume connector, as well as an early stage Kafka connector. Or you could just use a Java API to string data in. We have, a, we have a use case for aggregates, the real-time aggregates. We want to query and aggregate massive uh, data. Uh -huh. So how is this Kudu will fit into that kind of use case? Um, I guess it depends what you mean by real-time aggregate. We don't have a great feature like incrementing rows and keeping, keeping running aggregates. We're more built towards the idea that you would run a, a large query over a lot of data. Uh, rather than keeping, like, in HBase, this is a common thing where people increment a row thousands of times per second and then just fetch the row. That's not really our design point. Maybe someday we would implement something like that, uh, but it's not what we're going for today. Um, so given this col uh, columnar storage, is there any data integrity related to when you put everything in different tablets, essentially mm -hmm. you're only querying one. What if there are some bytes get switched or some data gets messed up, yeah. misaligned? Does so, that corrupt all the data? Or there so some... we have a tool. So the, the operations, the inserts, are what get replicated. And then the storage on each node is entirely separate. So if something got corrupted on one node, it wouldn't corrupt the others. Like let's say, I don't know, there was either a bug or a, um, 
a disk failure or something. Uh, we have a tool called KSCK, which is Kudu System Check, that you can point it at a tablet or a table, and it'll compute a running checksum at a particular snapshot of all the replicas and verify that they're bytewise identical of the data that you get out from a read. Uh, so we've used this in the past to find bugs during development. Uh, we haven't seen any divergence in real life applications, but um, we do have this tool, and that's definitely one of our primary concerns is like keep the data, number one, <laughs> everything else is secondary. Uh, so the question, if you couldn't hear, is the transaction model. Currently, we only support single row, um, read, modify, uh, you know, kind of basic HBase-like transactions. In the future, we hope to do multi-row transactions, but we haven't implemented that. Uh, nor will we, I think, this year, unless some people in the community step up and help out. Uh, so the question is how to handle unstructured data. I think this should be the last one to keep us on time. Um, so we don't really have great features yet for nested types, anything like that. We do have a binary type column. If you want to put in a protobuf or thrift structure or BSON, anything like that, you're welcome to, but Kudu won't do anything smart with it. Uh, definitely, I think, nested data and more unstructured data features.